This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and thank you for the great response to the interview we did last week with Megan Cole, an Afghanistan veteran. And I think it's really important we tell the stories of young veterans. We should remember that the Anzac story is not just about old veterans. They're very important and I'll continue to interview older veterans and to try and tell their stories and and relate to their history. But it's also important we remember the younger generation that, and we have probably 50 or 60,000 veterans in Australian society today who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And not only is it important that we tell their stories, it's just really interesting. And hopefully Megan's interview last week demonstrated that. I'm looking forward to talking to more younger veterans as we move forward. I'm very committed to the welfare of young veterans. And they really deserve to have their stories known. So look out for more interviews in the coming weeks and months with younger veterans. We've got a fantastic episode coming up today. Before we get into that, a couple of uh, just small announcements. Um, The sad news today that Jack Lyon, the last survivor of the Great Escape from uh, from 1944, has passed away today, aged 101. We lost a we lost a veteran only a, a month or two ago who was a survivor of the Great Escape. And now with Jack's passing, uh, he's the last of the survivors of the Great Escape. Jack, his story was interesting. He didn't actually get out in the tunnel during the Great Escape. He uh, he was a lookout, and he was due to go in the tunnel when the Germans discovered the escape. So he was captured in in the huts before he made it out, which probably saved his life because of the seventy six men that escaped, fifty were executed on the orders of Hitler. So Jack credits the fact that he never got into the tunnel as uh, as saving his life. Um, just a, a he was a wonderful man. He gave lots of great interviews, and he lived out the rest of his life in uh, in the UK. And sad to see that he passed away uh, today, and we've lost that connection now with those veterans of the Great Escape, isn't it? Isn't it sad how many veterans we're losing from the Second World War that fairly soon they'll all be gone? It's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a cliche to say it's the end of an era, but I feel very sad about the, the numbers that we are losing. So rest in peace, Jack. Um, I also want to do, talking about the Second World War, I also wanted to add that uh, if you enjoyed the Guadalcanal podcast I did uh, several episodes ago, which I know a lot of you did, um, I just wanted to mention we still have places on our Guadalcanal tour uh, in August. So if you want to go and walk the ground, I really recommend that you do it because it's a wonderful battlefield. It's only three hours from Australia. Really worth getting out there exploring. So if you do want to get over there, check our website at battlefields.com.au and come along with us on that Guadalcanal tour because it's going to be quite an adventure. Uh, moving away from the Second World War to today's episode of the podcast, we're going back in time a little bit. We're going to talk about the American Civil War and quite specifically some Australian connections, which I think you'll find fascinating. And joining us today to talk about this is a historian called Dale Blair, based down in Melbourne, who's done some wonderful work in this space. And I think you're going to be quite intrigued to discover just what Australian connections there are to the American Civil War and some of the absolutely incredible stories. So I'm a huge fan of the history of the Civil War and I I love walking those battlefields and I'm really looking forward to digging into this story and finding out about those Australian connections. So Dale, thanks very much for joining us on Living History. Lovely to um, be invited and glad to be chatting. So mate, Let's start. What got you so interested in the Civil War? It's a wonderful story. It's an intriguing chapter of history. But what was it that drew you to study the Civil War uh, specifically? Well, I was a child of the the 1960s, as were you know, most of my friends. And um, the Second World War and American Westerns were, were very popular on our TV screens back then. And so I, I got... Um, I got fascinated by these grey hats that would occasionally uh, kind of appear in the shows, and there would be these oblique references to places like Chickamauga in the dialogue in the mo- in, in the movies and and things. And um, but as a ten, you know, eleven year old, you don't have a great capacity to research. And and then Rin Tin Tin came along, and there was the grey hat again on 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 the, on the, on Rusty and. Uh, and then F Troop, and there was this great Civil War battle scene at the start of the um, uh, start of the show, and I was just fascinated to know, you know, what's this about? Because I kind of heard about the Revolution, but I didn't really know about the Civil War. And then it was on the back of comic books, and then um, so when I, um, you know, I, I, you know, the fascination took me to some encyclopedias, and I got the How and Why Wonder Book of the American Civil War, and then I got this. The thing that's kind of set me totally 
got me hook, line and sinker was this book called Heroes in Blue and Grey by Robert E. Alter. And it was, I don't know if you remember the Walt Whitman series books, Matt. And, and they were, you know, they had Flint Tin Tin and F Troop and Lassie and, and all those sorts of things. But they did a couple of historical series ones as well. And there was one on the Great War and there was one on the American Civil War. And it came out in 1964. And um, my school got it in, and I was in grade six, and I found it in the library, and I, I can remember the smell of it. I can remember the, exactly where I was sitting and reading it, and I just devoured that book. Uh, and that was really the start for me. From then on, I um, uh, there's a famous bookshop in Melbourne called Highlands Military Bookshop, and it's still going. And uh, I would you know, save up my pocket money, and once a month I'd sort of catch the train into Melbourne and buy a Civil War book. And so that's sort of how it how I got on and I just built up the library and just uh, continued sort of reading about it and uh, and then I joined the American Civil War Roundtable uh, and found out that my story was essentially the same story as everybody else in the group you know we'd all sort of come to it in the same kind of way and um, but we all been uh, in some ways touched by the centenary of the Civil War that had been um, so that kind of filtered through here in various ways there was bubble gum uh, I don't, again, you're probably too young to, to remember this, but there was um, uh, a bubblegum series called The Monies of the World or whatever, and I, uh, and I bought one of those one day and it had a Confederate dollar in it. So that just sort of further um, intrigued me. And um, so, yeah, so then it was really just a, a matter of, of pursuing it uh, uh, my own ends. Uh, and I felt like I was the only one, you know, this is the, the only, no one else sort of had an interest in it. And, um, uh, and then I've, when I turned 21, I actually travelled overseas to um, to America and two of the battlefields uh, for the first time. And then I did that 10 years later. Uh, and then after that trip, I joined the American Civil War Roundtable. Well, I'm sure you'll agree with me, mate, that no one does battlefields and remembrance better than the Americans on those Civil War battlefields. I mean, anyone who's been over there will just, just the, the obviously the money they put into it. But the way that they do it, it's it's, it's very, very special. And we could... You know, whatever you think of Americans, we could certainly learn some lessons from them in terms of remembrance and how they preserve battlefields and just the huge amount of respect they have. And the number of battlefield sites, I think there's something like 10,000 uh, Civil War battlefield sites in America, of which 350 odd have permanent museums and staff. And it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, and, and, and they got it from a young age as well. I mean, they, uh, very early in the peace with the Grand Army, the Republic, and they started to purchase uh, lots at Gettysburg, and, and then the, the government itself moved to nationalise some of the parkland. And then, of course, uh, again in the, the 1920s, you had a, a, a renewed effort to, to, um, to remember and to preserve those old battlefields. So, yeah, it's been a, it's a, it's been a terrific uh, endeavour uh, by Americans, uh, both north and south, and of all persuasions. So it's been, uh, and and apart from the, the Civil War history, if, if you have walked those battlefields, they're just some beautiful countryside as well. That's the that's the other thing about it. So, uh, but yes, they've, they've certainly been uh, aware of that. And then you have, of course, the whole reenactment scene over there, which is uh, something again. Um, and I had the the joy of uh, participating in the. Uh, the Gettysburg reenactment um, for the 150th there a few years back. So uh, that was something very special. Tell us about Australia's connection to the Civil War, Dale, because it's it's not a context we often think of in terms of the Civil War. But Australia, um, I mean, at that time, Australia had some fairly strong connections with America, both in our, our history, you know, our sort of colonial history, um, but also, uh, you know, a few other direct connections. I mean, tell us a little bit about Australia's connection. Firstly, did we support a particular side? Were we more in favour of North winning or South winning? I mean, tell us more about Australia's involvement. The um, You had a large uh, population of Americans here as a result of the goldfields. So some of the goldfield populations were upward of 30% of Americans. And, and they came from, you know, all, all places in America and California in particular. In fact, Californians on the goldfield were often referred, referred to as Californians and not American um, in the, because of the Republican sentiment and that sort of thing. But you had a, a cross-section there and, uh, <coughs> and some of those sort of people made their way uh, into the city. But uh, really, um, Australians were interested observers uh, and Britain, of course, was, uh, because we were a colony of Britain, we shared much of the British view uh, of it. Um, the 
and I'm going to be a bit Melbourne centric here, Matt. And I do apologise to uh, those others around Australia, but um, uh, in uh, in Australia, the reportage of the civil war from the major parties, uh, sorry, from the major papers, the Age was pro union, and uh, the Argus and the Herald here in Melbourne were pro southern in the editorial. So uh, you did get kind of that um, that uh, partisanship. Uh, was reflected uh, certainly in the reportage of the war here in, in our newspapers, uh, but it was a long way away. And um, as British um, as British subjects, uh, Queen Victoria issued a proclamation of neutrality early on in the war. They didn't want uh, any British subjects participating in the in the war. They didn't want any British subjects assisting um, uh, either of the sides in the conflict. Uh, they recognised uh, the Confederacy as a uh, as a genuine or bona fide belligerent, but they didn't recognise the state, uh, the Confederates as a state in itself. Uh, so that was sort of the, the British position, position uh, on it, and that was kind of um, what the Australians were sort of abiding by at that point in time. So, um, but it was quite a ways away and uh, you know news was was taking 10 to 12 weeks to get here because it would be relayed to Britain and then through here and of course it you didn't have the cables connecting the, the world uh, as you did soon after the Civil War so it was all reliant on uh, newspapers uh, being conveyed from one point of the um, of the Empire to the other so uh, but surprise surprise in 1865 um, a confederate ship turns up in melbourne so that was the where we started to get a real tangible uh, kind of uh, connection with the war and certainly the american civil war roundtable sort of focuses in on that as um, as a point of interest yeah i'm looking forward to uh to getting into that in a bit more detail just before we do does your research dale indicate that the civil war was an important topic to australians at this time or was it simply a background noise that was taking place in a far-flung corner of the world. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it's background noise in the sense that, you know, America was a great experiment at that time. This is a great republic. And, of course, you know, they they'd, um, uh, was forged in iron uh, through conflict and the, the revolution and then the war of independence. And so, you know, this is a great experiment. So the world was sort of watching what was going to happen in America. And so this was uh, the Civil War had um, you know, uh, a great import, if you like, into the way the world was going to be shaped and, and, uh, and um, justifying um, you know, new nation states and things like that. It was a, some people look upon the Civil War as part of the age of revolution. So from the 1848, you kind of have the, the European revolutions going on and right through uh, into the early 60s with Garibaldi, of course, in Italy uh, and these wars of unification and separation. And so for some people, you know, whether the Confederacy lived or died was just sort of part of that, that story, but, but it was of great interest. And, um, and of course, uh, it was important in the sense that um, the trade uh, was, you know, it was a, it was a, a large nation. And uh, so trade with America was an important thing, for, certainly for Britain. Uh, cotton, of course, was, um, was often referred to as King Cotton. Uh, because of its important in the world markets, and so you know the outcome of the civil war was was going to be significant on um, uh, on uh, on world affairs, uh, and of course the the one thing uh, above all things with the American civil war was the fate of slavery. So uh, and and that of course was was on the out uh, in most of the uh, throughout the British Empire, um, but it, it was still hanging on in America. And um, so just from a uh, humanitarian or civil rights sort of um, uh, point of view, that was a, a, an enormous question that the rest of the world uh, and Australia was interested in as well. Did we see much, given the population of Americans living in Australia, the fairly substantial population, the importance that this conflict was seen around the world, did we see many people actually leaving Australia to go to America for the purpose of enlistment in the uh, in the war? No, you don't. You, you, there's only a handful uh, of people that uh, have been identified. And uh, I've got to say the... Um, there are others in in my in the Civil War Roundtable who are much more um, uh, up to date with with exactly who those people are. But it wasn't many. No, not many people were were making the journey. 
uh, A, it was a long way uh, away, and those people that uh, were in Australia at the time, of course, were here for, for very private reasons uh, and of getting themselves, uh, advancing themselves uh, through mining or, or whatever it might be, uh, or business. So you had people like Freeman Cobb, for instance, uh, of Cobb and & Co, and uh, he was from Massachusetts, and he'd come out to a to Australia and he founded the Cobb & Co Company, which would be one of the biggest companies here in Australia for the next 70 odd years, right, right through until the, the um, depression times. And he brought out American stage coaches, American drivers, and he fashioned out a, a very um, a lucrative um, kind of business for himself. And uh, well, he actually does return to America. He's one of the ones that does return to America, uh, but he doesn't fight. He becomes a uh, Massachusetts state senator uh, in 1864 and 65. So, you know, he had a, some of that kind of stuff going on. But um, but for the most part, most people, Americans that were here, they were, they were here for the long haul, really. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And uh, one of the things that always strikes me about the Civil War in the research that I've done in Australia is we have this feeling that in the 19th century, we were very isolated from America, we were very isolated from the rest of the world. Um, but I'm always fascinated by the number of little links that pop up. And I know that, for example, in West Terrace Cemetery in Adelaide, I've seen a couple of graves of Civil War veterans who emigrated to Australia, uh, obviously in the years after the Civil War, and lived out their lives in Adelaide. So it's, it's incredible to think that th there was actually a lot of immigration at this time. There was a great movement of people around the world at this stage. And it continued, of course, right up until the First World War, when we note the, the huge numbers of British citizens who served in the Australian forces and also, in reverse, the number of Australians that served in British forces. So it was a time, wasn't it, where there was there, we weren't quite cut off from the rest of the world. There was a lot of movement of people at this time, perhaps more so than there even is today. Yeah, I, um, Australia was it was seen as an exotic place. I mean, it was it was uh, one of the newer discoveries you know, in the world, and uh, certainly populated by you know uh, Europeans. So um, Americans were aware of Australia. They were um, it was well reported through lots of the journals, things like Blackwood's Magazine and uh, those sorts of things. We've had had international um, uh, standing and. So yeah, no, uh, Australia was certainly no backwater, and um, it, and it did attract people. I mean, Mark Twain, of course, one of the famous people that that would come out here, and um, uh, so uh, yeah, there was uh, there was an awareness of Australia, and uh, people people were making that journey, and and just on that post-war uh, immigration, if you like, uh, with the Civil War. After the war, a lot of Southerners um, uh, basically. Travel overseas because they they uh, fought for their independence, didn't get it, and then did not want to live uh, in a country where they felt that uh, you know they would be living under the yoke of um, uh, of uh, Union um, despots basically, and so so many Confederates actually uh, took to the land so to speak and uh, and uh, travelled around the world. It was an incredible time in America. You you see signs of it whenever you travel throughout America. Probably some of those wounds have never healed to today. But I remember seeing, for example, when I was at Gettysburg the first time, seeing the wonderful uh, sculpture of um, of General Lee, the Confederate general, uh, on the battlefield. And there's a, a sign next to it, which is obviously very, very old, probably as old as the memorial itself, that says there will be a fine of $500 for anyone who defaces this memorial. So it's incredible to think that in the years after that memor that monument was built, in, the, in the, the latter part of the 19th century, there was still an issue with people coming in defacing it, so much so that they actually had to post signs saying, you know, we've already repaired this a few times. If you continue to do it, you're going to... And $500 would have been a massive fine 100 years ago. And it reflected to me that... I, I love that they've left that sign in place because that tells part of the story of the, of, of the relationship between North and South for decades after the Civil War. It's, it's a really fascinating part of the story that we don't really spend enough time exploring. Yeah, the, um, uh, as you move on and you, and you examine you know, uh, the history, you become aware of that, well, I won't say I was a victim, but I was certainly uh, um, influenced by the whole lost cause myth um, after the Civil War, which was basically a... Um, you know, a southern narrative, but it was shared by northerners as well, and it was kind of enabled in which um, it's uh, allowed for this fairly uh, sanitised version of the South's reasons for going to war, etc. So it becomes, you know, that it was about the war between the states and that 
Confederate soldiers in having fought that war with a, themselves demonstrating uh, that they were in fact patriotic Americans because they had, you know, they had fought for a cause they believed in. Uh, and so they were on a par, if you like, with those in the Union forces that were fighting to preserve the Union. Now, back at the, you know, at, at the close of the Civil War, of course, there was a, a numbers of people that just saw the Confederates as traitors. I mean, they were, uh, you know, and then when they wanted Robert E. Lee actually sort of hung because, uh, you know, he had led this armed resistance against the against the Union. So that starts to change after the Civil War, and and, and the battlefield preservation and the statues that are erected at the battlefields are all part of that process, and it's and it's basically a healing process. But it's a healing process for white America, not, uh, and, it, and it does tend to exclude um, uh, African Americans uh, in that process. And so, uh, yeah, the, the whole statue debate that's going on at the moment is, is really fascinating. I just just find it remarkable. And um, uh, one of the remarkable things I find about it is just the Southern intransigence about accepting what that war was about. It's one of the most interesting aspects of the war. Obviously, it, it, I'm, I'm, obviously, it's 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 not a great uh, statement to say that the causes of the war are some of the most interesting aspects. But I think in the case of the American Civil War, it's absolutely fa- absolutely fascinating that that turmoil between the, the the members of the South as to what they were actually fighting for was it to preserve slavery? Was it for states' rights? Just the the, compl- the complicated narrative. I mean, from the North, it was fairly straightforward. We're fighting to preserve the Union. But from the from the perspective of the South, there were a huge number of competing interests, and I think just about every state in the South had a different reason for wanting to participate in that conflict. Just a, an absolutely fascinating uh, fascinating part of the history. It is, um, although if you sort of drill down into it, you, you will find that slavery is based. Uh, Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, basically says it's the cornerstone of the Confederacy. It's enshrined in the Confederate Constitution. It's um, it's uh, it appears in ordinances of secession. Um, George's comes to mind. So uh, it was there. Um, you know, it was clearly understood, certainly by the leaders uh, at that time, that uh, the preservation of slavery was really the the the, the reason for the secession and 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 uh, the need to uh, have an independent confederacy, to basically to protect that institution. Now there's a whole host of other, you know, people bringing counterpoints. Well, you know, most Southerners didn't own slaves, and uh, well, no, that's true. So um, then you get down into the, you know, what does the common fighting man fight for? You know, um, d- does he separate his fight for independence or the fight for his um, his his home from that? larger question of slavery and 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 they're all valid points uh, uh, of course you know and and this is this is sort of what underpins the heritage argument by by many white southerners today in defense of the the statues so it is complicated as you say but uh but it's certainly heated (laughs) absolutely i when you when you mention that the motivations for the people in the south fighting i'm reminded that of of shelby foot the great historian and one of his quotes uh, that he came across of um, a union force occupied a southern town and there was a really old man dressed in a Confederate uniform that was captured as they swept through the town. And they basically pulled him aside and said, what are you, what are you doing? What, what are you fighting for? And his answer was, I'm fighting because you guys are down here. And I mean, I think for a lot of the men on the front line, that certainly sums it up. While we're talking about the South, I want to get into this. You mentioned the this this Confederate ship which came to Australia. And this is not only the strongest connection between Australia and the American Civil War, but also one of the most amazing stories to do with the Civil War. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about shipping at this time. Navies were relatively new um, in the way, you know, in the, in the modern sense. Um, tell us about the, the development of shipping during the, the Civil War, the importance of shipping, and exactly what was going on from a naval context at this time. Okay, so in the, so in terms of um, Civil War strategy, you have, uh, you have a, a river strategy and you also have uh, an ocean strategy. So the, the rivers uh, are obviously very important waterways and uh, highways, if you like, uh, uh, into enemy territory, particularly over in the west. Uh, in uh, uh, Western Theatre, where the um, Mississippi is, and uh, and so these are vital, so vital waterways. So, what uh, became 
uh, used on those were gunboats, so they were lighter, shallow um, vessels, so gunboats. Uh, the ironclads, of course, started to be developed, um, and these were generally, initially, they were just uh, old wooden keel ships that were then just clad with iron, basically, thus the name ironclads, and these would be used um, on, uh, on the waterways. The North were always better armed in that sort of sense. The Confederates were uh, tended to um, hobble together their, their river fleets and were tended not to be in anywhere near the same power, uh, have the same power as the northern ships. Um, but, of course, uh, you saw the use of mines on the rivers. You saw chain um, chains put across rivers to try and debar the passage of these, these, these gunboats, etc. So both sides engaged in that. The North then, uh, it, if you like, its ocean-going navy was then used to blockade the southern ports. Uh, and this, as the war went on, became uh, the whole boa constrictor kind of um, uh, strategy. Uh, and they just tightened their hold on those southern ports. So for the Confederacy, from its infancy, um, it didn't have a fleet. So it had to try and fashion a naval fleet. And to do that, it decided to engage privateers and it sent agents over to Europe and to, to Britain to try and buy ships that they could, uh, that they could then use um, as commerce raiders, basically. So for people familiar with the First and Second World War and the German uh, use of raiders in those wars, well, the Confederate uh, strategy was very similar to that. So that they were going to buy these, these uh, fast-moving uh, sailing vessels uh, and they would be used to attack um, American commerce on the on the high seas. Uh, it's also a period where you see the transition from steam uh, from sail to steam. So um, ships like the uh, Alabama and the Shenandoah, of course, are actually uh, classified as steam ships as well. So steam is and this is one of the sticking points for later on with the uh, Alabama Claims Tribunal and things like that about what sort of ship is it, you know, is it a sailing ship, is it a steam ship? Essentially, the steam uh, steam power was an auxiliary power. They were uh, three-masted um, full sailing vessels. So um, so that was the, they became the, the Alabama, of course, um, the Shenandoah, the Florida was another one, the Tallahassee were probably the, the principal uh, Confederate raiders. Um, yeah, so, so that, was, that was the strategy from the, the southern point of view. So it's the Shenandoah we're obviously most interested in. What brought the Shenandoah to Australia? Tell us her story and the connection with Australia. Well, she was um, purchased over in uh, Liverpool. Uh, it was uh, she was actually uh, the Sea King was her original name, and she was basically built. Uh, she was a very new ship, um, 1863 when she was built, uh, and she was used for basically the the trade route from China and India. Uh, so she'd done a run down to to India, China. She'd taken troops, uh, British troops, from there to New Zealand uh, as part of the Maori the Maori War, and then returned to to Britain. Uh, she was then purchased by a Confederate agent, uh, and uh, she was then sailed out uh, to sea on the pretense that she was going back to Bombay. Uh, she was taken then to um, just off uh, Madeira in Spain. Uh, there was another ship, a supply ship called the Laurel, and that brought um, 18 officers and the captain. So 19 Confederate officers got off the Laurel, manned the ship, uh, and they, they asked for volunteers off the Laurel, uh, and a number of men came forward. They ended up with 23 crew. Now, it had a complement of 150, but they sailed off with only 42, 43 men on board, half of which were officers, right, to, to, to try and to, to get the, the ship. And she set off on a way. Uh, she passed down the from there down the west coast of um, Africa around uh, the Cape of Good Hope, and then started to make her way toward Australia. Uh, she suffered damage um, at Cape Leeuwin, just off New South, uh, sorry, just off Western Australia. Damaged um, the propeller shaft uh, on that, and then decided to make their way to Melbourne. They knew that there was a steam packet uh, in Melbourne on the 26th of every month. That steam packet would leave um, Melbourne. Uh, as a male steamer, they wanted to catch, uh, basically get a, a 
catch that ship so that they could get off letters and also that they could also find out uh, information about uh, what was happening back in America. Uh, so they sailed into uh, into Melbourne. She was um, passed through the heads. Uh, she was met by a pilot here. Um, they were inspected and then they uh, entered the Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne. They anchored at Sandridge, just off um, uh, Sandridge, what you would know as Port Melbourne uh, today. And uh, they uh, sent a delegation ashore to to contact the governor. The governor at that time was Governor Darling. Uh, said um, you know that they were um, they that they required some repairs, uh, and this is where it all gets a bit complicated um, in terms of you know well, what uh, what assistance could uh, the port of Melbourne render this ship um, if it was uh, damaged that made her unseaworthy, well, there was an obligation uh, under the, the uh, naval treaties to, to repair that and send her on away. Um, it was allowed that she could be filled up with coal to get her to the next Confederate port. Um, so all these things were invoked uh, by the Confederate captain, whose name was James Iredale Waddell. So, uh, so that uh, then brought them in conflict with the U.S. consul here in Melbourne at the time. His name was William Blanchard, uh, and of course he started to lobby the governor to try and get rid of this ship from the port. Uh, and so you, you then had really quite a um, uh, an interesting three weeks in Melbourne, where you know photographs are being taken, uh, depositions are being uh, uh, being taken from uh, prisoners released from the Shenandoah because on her journey down from from Spain, she captured, uh, I think it was about eight um, other ships uh, on the way. Uh, and from those, she took um, prisoners uh, and those people were then released once they got to Melbourne. And of course, the first thing they did was go straight to the US consul and, and tell them their story. And so uh, you had this quite a um, uh, bit of espionage going on in Melbourne around the Shenandoah. Uh, so so that, was, that was how she got here and uh, from there on, Oh, numbers of social engagements, Matt, that, uh, you know, they, uh, which says a lot about uh, colonial society at the time. They were um, approached by uh, members of the Melbourne Club, the prestigious Melbourne Club. They were invited to come to the Melbourne Club. A special dinner was held uh, for them uh, there with 60 people in attendance. And uh, among those in attendance was the former US consul, um, James Frank McGuire. Uh, he was actually... Uh, a pro southerner, it was probably why he was removed um, as the consul. Well, he was a member of the um, the Melbourne Club. Uh, Frederick Charles Standish, he was the commissioner of police. Um, Thomas Hamilton Littleton, he was the superintendent of police. A number of the government ministers were members of the Melbourne Club, and uh, a number of these men uh, attend this dinner, which is uh, you know uh, in honour of these Confederate officers, and so. Um, and of course, then later on in the piece, uh, Standish and Littleton are going to have to deploy the police around the ship uh, in response to complaints made by the US consul. It must have been a dramatic time in Melbourne. It must have been people, you know, because I assume people's loyalties in Melbourne were just as divided as they were uh, in the US itself. So the, the un- unannounced arrival of a Confederate ship plus a Confederate raider must have caused absolute shockwaves in Melbourne society. Oh, it did. It, um, for, for one point, the fact that you had a foreign armed vessel in the bay reawakened all the fears of the Russian invasion um, scare that had happened during the Crimea War. Uh, and so that kind of acted as a bit of a catalyst in, in the, the post-Civil War period to actually bolster up Victorian defences, you know, um, because it was seen that we were vulnerable. But for Americans in the um, in the town, and uh, you know, it was um, a, a great point of interest and excitement. And so Waddell uh, received many uh, anonymous um, letters from Americans uh, once he got uh, got into port, uh, stating that you know we're, we're going to blow up the ship, um, uh, and then others were sort of warning him of the, the dangers and beware of this. And so you know, the pro Confederates were sort of um, you know, giving him the warnings, and then there was the the pro union people sort of threatening the ships. Uh, you've got all that going on, yeah. And um, uh, and of course, the U.S. consul working overtime to try and uh, prove that they've um, that they're recruiting um, 
uh, men in the port, which of course under the Neutrality Act and of course under the Foreign Enlistments Act of um, 1819, they're not entitled to do. Um, so, you know, you've got all that going on, but then you've got the general public who are just fascinated by this ship. And so uh, what happens in the first sort of day or, or, or a couple of days, 7,000 people catch the train from Melbourne down to Sandridge because uh, you had the railway line uh, there and just to, to look at the ship uh, and they were getting into small boats, rowing out to the ship. They were uh, allowed ashore. And so, you know, that whilst she was anchored off Port Melbourne there, uh, yeah, thousands of visitors flocked to the ship uh, to, to have a look at this man of war, basically, and uh, and uh, and meet the crew. And uh, yeah, so it was really a, a huge social event. Was there any official reprimand from the United States government that we had this you know, enemy ship tied up in one of our major ports? Certainly, Blanchard was was uh, arguing that uh, that the ship's present was against. Um, the Neutrality Act and, uh, and and against all those sorts of things that uh, these men were pirates, um, uh, particularly under the uh, I think it was the the Declaration of Paris, which had come out after the Crimean War, which incidentally America wasn't a signatory to, but Britain certainly was. So he was certainly arguing the case that this ship had no right to be there, that it needed to be moved on, uh, and he was putting a lot of pressure uh, on on Darling, and Darling got to a point. Because the ship was there for three weeks, uh, Matt. It was, she arrived on the 25th of January and she departs on the 18th of uh, February. So that's like 24 days that the ship is actually in port. What had happened was uh, they'd sent a diver down to look at the uh, look at the ship. They found that the damage was um, was greater than they had first anticipated. Uh, the government then set. Uh, uh, an independent uh, group of men or engineers to look at it to confirm whether that was in case uh, was in fact the case, and they actually confirmed that it was that the ship was uh, in need of uh, major uh, repair. So she was then transferred to Williamstown on, and put onto the government slip, which just kind of incensed Blanchard even more. More the fact that it was now on a on an official government slip being repaired. Um, but so yeah, all that was um, all that was certainly um, in the mix, Matt. It was, um, and in the meantime, the the officers and uh, on the ship were being fated by society. They were staying at, at uh, some of the Melbourne Club members, put them up in their homes. A delegation was sent down from Ballarat, inviting them uh, to come up to uh, to Ballarat to to visit the gold fields and visit that city. Uh, these were leading business businessmen that came down and invited them up and. Four or five of the officers actually go up and they have a, a, a ball in their honour. It was called the, the Buccaneers Ball. And they took the train to Geelong and then they, from Geelong they went on to Ballarat. And, um, and the well-to-do of Ballarat society um, came out um, for that ball. And um, so you had both in Melbourne and in Ballarat, um, basically it was the societal elites that were were, were, um, were looking upon them as, as very... Uh, important guests, if you like, and, and, and probably it would be fair to say that many of those people were sympathetic with the Southern cause. Just an extraordinary state of affairs. How did the, uh, how did the ship go with its efforts to recruit more sailors to join the voyage? Well, this is always, uh, um, you know, they were very conscious of the fact that the Neutrality Act was, was in vogue in the port, so, uh, um, so they, were, they didn't want to be too... Um, uh, what we call it, overt uh, in their efforts, but clearly they had agents out there who were recruiting. Uh, some of those men would have just uh, volunteered their services to the ship, but they couldn't be seen to be um, uh, to be openly recruiting. And this, of course, is what um, Blanchard was was um, was trying to, uh, to to prove that they they were in fact recruiting soldiers uh, or sailors. Um, some of the crew that had previously that had been on the ship when she arrived, they actually deserted and they went straight to the consul and they gave sworn affidavits uh, saying that, oh yes, um, they're recruiting um, sailors here, recruiting crew. Um, this was then taken to uh, um, to to Blanch, uh, not to Blanchard, to Darling as proof that this was happening. Um, so he sort of then had was compelled to act on this. So he sends down uh, the police to surround the ship. Uh, the militia come out and, and, and man the um, <laughs> man the batteries at Williamstown. 
So uh, you have the ship on the, the Confederate ship on the patent on the slip there at, um, at Williamstown, surrounded by the police and the militia has been called out, and they want to search the ship. Well, he refuses to do that because uh, the uh, under international law, the, the decks of a, uh, of a, um, uh, uh, a fighting ship are deemed um, the um, uh, the property uh, of that country or the, the land, if you like, of that country. So for you to go aboard that ship is to forcibly, is to actually invade. So uh, he refused to allow them to come on. Uh, in the meantime, the Williamstown Water Police um, arrested four men s seen leaving the ship. Uh, these were then taken to uh, to court and statements were made and they were, they were uh, charged with uh, having um, uh, enlisted uh, and in contrary to the Neutrality Act and the Foreign Enlistments Act. Uh, of course, when this was put to uh, Waddell, the commander of the Confederate ship, he just denied it. He said, no, well, they would have been stowaways. I had no knowledge of, uh, of them. Um, and when the ship actually finally sails out, so by that stage it was late in the peace and um, Darling was sort of over the controversy of it. They just wanted to see the ship on its way now and uh, she took on 250 tonnes of coal uh, and then sailed out um, uh, of the heads and back into the open ocean and on board were 42 um, recruits um, who miraculously all appeared once the, uh, the ship uh, cleared the heads. Were those new recruits, were they uh, Australians or mostly Americans who had been living in Australia? Most of them were British and Scottish, Irish. Um, there were a couple of Australians uh, on board. Uh, probably about half a dozen. Um, we know two of those Australians returned uh, to Melbourne uh, to, to, to keep the most um, probably famous is uh, William Kenyon, uh, who uh, would later become a publican down at um, uh, Port Melbourne. Um, but yes, um, uh, most of them were, were actually um, British, yeah. So, so not many Americans among them at all. What did the Shenandoah do for the remainder of the war? Well, she sailed um, out of uh, Melbourne. She hit the. She headed sort of toward New Zealand. Say, sailed kind of northwestern New Zealand, uh, then up through into the Caroline Islands. She took some prizes up there. She then headed up toward the Bering Straits uh, in the Bering Sea, which is up near Siberia and Alaska. There, because her prime objective was to to hit the the whaling fleets. So that was because uh, whale in whale oil was a was a, a, a important commodity, uh, so the the aim, basically, the mission was to to hit the the whaling fleets in both the North Pacific, uh, in the Southern Oceans, and uh, then up around the Arctic Circle as well. Just to clarify on that point, Dale, are you talking about only United States shipping or any ship she came across? Most mostly it was uh, uh, U.S. commerce, yeah, that they, that they were. They were hitting. Well, the, you, you threw out the word pirate earlier on. It does seem, I mean, I'm no uh, expert on uh, on naval law, but it does seem that ships sailing around attacking and capturing and, and looting other ships uh, is the very definition of piracy. Yes, uh, and that was the point of contention. Uh, and that's when the, the, the US actually take um, uh, lodge a c uh, claim against... Uh, the, the United uh, Kingdom for damages caused by shipping purchased um, through through Britain that served the Confederacy. Uh, it was a very famous uh, case that ran for a number of years, but uh, ultimately it was uh, resolved in favour of the United States. And um, they took all up. The Confederate Raiders took, I think it was uh, 173 ships in, in prizes, and the Alabama had taken 65 of those. The Shenandoah, Shenandoah took 38, um, so um, six of which were bonded. I think they called it bonded, um, where they would, you know, release the ship, but uh, you would be on a bound to, to pay this ransom or bond later on. So, um, yeah, so all up... Uh, that tribunal, which was held in Geneva, uh, and it found that the United Kingdom had to pay fifteen and a half million dollars in gold to the um, to the United States for damages um, caused by those Confederate raiders. 
of which 3.9 million was attributed to the Shenandoah. Wow, absolutely fascinating. I had no idea about that chapter of the story. So how did the uh, how did the Shenandoah end up at the end of the war, and uh, what was the fate of the ship and its half dozen crew of hardy Australians that had joined it in Melbourne? She well, she continued on up into the, into the north. So of course, by the time the Shenandoah is commissioned, the South is is basically on on the back foot. So you know she comes into service late uh, in September of eighteen sixty four by. Atlanta falls uh, by November. Uh, Lincoln is re-elected. Of course, uh, Lee is pinned back into Petersburg uh, by that stage as well. So the war is pretty much, uh, you know, starting to um, uh, be all over. But um, but they continue on. Uh, and in June, and this is after um, uh, the last Confederates have, have, have surrendered uh, on land, She's still taking ships, and um, so half of what she takes, actually, she takes after the end of the war, uh, effectively. And uh, she would capture a, a ship, or she would find a ship, and she would get a newspaper, and they would, she would, they were told that the war was over, uh, that Lee had surrendered, etc. But uh, so Waddell wanted proof, so he was given a newspaper. In that same newspaper, this is in June, it said yes, Lee had certainly surrendered, but Jeff Davis had said that the the fight would continue. So on that basis, Waddell continued sailing the ship and continued taking prizes. And then a few weeks later in September, uh, sorry, August, they um, are apprised through another newspaper report that, in fact, uh, that uh, Johnson's army has surrendered and Je uh, and that, um, that uh, Jefferson Davis has been captured and that the war in is indeed over. And so Waddell then decides that, well, I must um, surrender the ship. But because of this question of piracy, Lincoln at the outset of the war had declared that any privateers uh, would be considered pirates and that uh, those pirates would be hung uh, if, um, if captured. So with that knowledge, they don't want to take the ship back to America because they don't quite know what their status is going to be in terms of uh, if they surrender the ship. So they decide to take the ship back to Liverpool. So they sail um, back south and they head around, this time the Cape Horn and bottom of South America, and then they head up uh, to, to Britain again and they surrender the ship to British authorities uh, in, in Liverpool. So from whence she had come, she returns and, um, yeah, so it's surrendered there to, to the British. They parole the prisoners. Uh, again, this was interesting. They had... Um, you know, they, they got all the, the crew that were on board and they had, as the crew had increased as they took more prizes, so some of the people that were captured would then volunteer their services uh, to the ship and, and would then join uh, as uh, sailors on the, on the Shenandoah. Um, so they were able to supplement the crew um, that way for, for a time. But when they got to um, surrender the boat to the British authorities, uh, the British authorities declared that they were all American citizens, which was a patent lie, uh, and this was simply just to avoid any conflict with um, uh, with basically Charles Francis um, Adams, who was the the American um, envoy there, who was doing exactly what Blanchard had done uh, in Melbourne. He was uh, actively trying to undermine Confederate uh, efforts in in Britain and to bring those to the attention of the British government, etc. So, um, so the crew, in fact, were Waddell stayed on in Liverpool with his wife. Uh, a number of the others uh, went to Europe. Uh, some went to South America. Argentina was a popular port of call. Mexico, others went because there was quite a significant Confederate migration into Mexico after the war. Uh, and into um, the Argentine. So um, so they followed that because, again, they didn't quite know what their status was going to be um, after the war. But as, you know, the years, uh, it became evident that they could go back to America and some of them did that. Where they'll return to Annapolis where he lived out uh, his life. I think he was kind of uh, in charge of the oyster fleet down there at some stage. I think I read somewhere. So... Uh, and of those Australians, we only know that two of them returned to um, to, to Melbourne. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, Kenyon would live his, get married, have children, and become a publican at uh, Port Melbourne. The other, I don't quite know um, the uh, the status of. Uh, 
of those four men that left the ship, but one of those chaps' names was James Davidson, otherwise known as Charlie. They were prosecuted uh, under the Neutralities Act in the Magistrates Court, found guilty, and uh, uh, a month sort of after the Shenandoah had left, and they were, they were, I think the sentence was 10 days jail. So it was a fairly nominal sentence, and um, but justice was seen to have been carried out, uh, if you like. Uh, the ship itself was then uh, given to the U.S. Consul uh, and the United States um, government. They then sold it to a private concern, and that person on sold it to the Sultan of Zanzibar, uh, where she was in service as a royal yacht for some time. She got damaged in a hurricane. Oh, I can't quite remember the date, but it was the 1870s, and then she was repaired after that and then uh, was heading to India where she took on water and sunk um, on the way. So she's lost in the Indian Ocean somewhere. Well, it's just an extraordinary story, Dale. I mean, especially the the, the bit that strikes me is it's a, 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 an American ship that never actually went to America. So, I mean, it's just a... It's an absolutely extraordinary story and um, it's it's really wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Oh, that's all right. Look, the other interesting point about it is, is the, the journey that she took. I mean, you probably no other ship had probably done a journey like that since Captain Cook. So, uh, you know, in circumnavigating the world, she visited every ocean bar the Antarctic. So, um, uh, so it was, a, yeah, quite, quite a... Uh, Quite a voyage. Just an absolutely fascinating story, Dale. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing it with us. It's uh, every time we look into these chapters of history, we find more interesting angles, and I think this has been a perfect example of those. So, if you're listening to this, go out and um, do some research on the Shenandoah, find out more about it. There might even be a connection with your local community. Um, Dale Blair, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Matt. Thank you very much. And can I just add that if people are interested in uh, the Civil War, Australia and all things um, related, that uh, they can just go on the interweb and find the American Civil War Roundtable and we have uh, chapters in uh, in Melbourne and Sydney. So uh, if people want to get uh, involved, uh, we'd love to see them. <laughs>